Every year, one of the highlights of Buttonwood is the, um, is the Badgett Lecture. Um, as I said earlier, we have had Mervyn King and Larry Summers and a variety of people doing it. And this year, we wanted to have somebody um, to give a slightly different perspective. And so we turned to Mohammed al Erin, who's an old friend, not just of The Economist, but also of Buttonwood, having been here before. And I think there are three things to say about um, Mohammed beyond what he does here. First, that he's an extremely nice and courteous person to deal with. Secondly, he's a very good writer, as you can see from the op-eds that he does around. And the last is that he's very good at his day job, too. And so with that introduction, I'm going to turn over to Mohammed al and I'm going to come back and ask some questions at the end. And we should have time for a couple of questions from you as well. But thank you very much. And over to Mohammed. Good afternoon. I am absolutely delighted to be here. Um, I'd like you to imagine how exciting it is for me to be at this function. I started reading The Economist as a kid when I was 15 years old at boarding school, and I haven't stopped since. And for me to be here with you today is a, an absolute thrill. What I'd like to do today is the following provide you with relatively simple frameworks to think about an incredibly complex and fluid world. And we should have no doubts whatsoever that we live in a very fluid and complex world. Let me give you a simple test. Let me ask you the question, when things happen that are either unlikely or unthinkable. Isn't the system trying to tell you something? I've listed on the first slide behind me a list of things that have happened over the last 18 months. Each one of those was unlikely, if not unthinkable. And yet, every single one is fact today. So imagine the combined probability of all these unthinkables and unlikely events happening. And that speaks to the fluid and complex world that we live in. We believe, and this is for discussion, we believe that you can explain these things using a relatively simple framework. If you like what economists or econometricians call the reduced form equation, a few things that explain not everything, but explain the bulk of what's going on. And if we are correct, they also provide insights into what's coming in terms of distributions of likely outcomes. Let me start with a snapshot of where we stand. I don't know about you, but there's lots of things I like about The Economist, from very opinionated editorials to insightful articles from very operationally oriented coverage to out of the box pieces, and from global overviews to very local focus. But there's something else that I'd like to admit that I like about The Economist. Every Thursday now, when I get it on my iPad, I actually look forward to the cover. I love the cover of The Economist. <laughs> Hardly ever is there a cover that is not both provocative and communicates a lot of information. Now, I can't even imagine what's it like to come up with an Economist cover, but I did ask the question, what if I had to design a cover for this talk? What would it look like? And let me suggest it would look like something like this. At the front of the global economy is a bunch of brave, courageous, bold central bankers. They have taken us out of the global financial crisis, but they're operating in a very still dark place. It's muddy, it's murky, and visibility is not very clear, and the map they have doesn't tell them very much. And yet they are going forward. Who are they pulling along? Politicians. These politicians seem to be more interested in bickering and dithering than in leading. And then there's a third group, ordinary citizens, bewildered, 
Some of them are rejecting this whole thing and walking away. Others are just being dragged along, not quite sure where they're going, but knowing that they didn't like where they were. This, for me, is what the global economy looks like today. The question is twofold for us. First, how stable is this? Can it hold together? And secondly, where is, gonna, where is it going to lead? So the first part is about the journey. Are these three groups going to hold together during the journey? And the second is about the destination. Where are they going to end up? Now let's start and, and talk a little bit about these various groups. Let's start with the central bankers. There should be no doubt for anybody in this room that the central banks are, quote, all in. They are all in in terms of trying to find a way to buy time for the system so that the system can heal. The ECB, you know what President Draghi said on, January 20, on July 26 in London? It wasn't just that the ECB would do whatever it takes. It was also, quote, believe me, it will be enough. And the result of that culminated in a new program to buy government securities, turning the ECB into a quasi-fiscal entity in a way that would have been unimaginable not so long ago. And remember, it is unlimited purchases subject to pretty light conditionality. The key to what they're doing is the attempt to remove two risks that Europe faces, fragmentation risk and currency convertibility risk. And they are trying to find a way of doing so by reconciling what the creditors want to see, conditionality, and what the debtors want to see, enormous financing. And unless you do that, you don't reconcile these three basic issues. This has been our roadmap from day one of the European crisis back in 2009. If you cannot have a solution that solves for these three issues at the same time, the crisis continues. And they are the mutualization of debt to make sure that debt ends up in the right places. Second, policy assurances that not only deal with the immediate fiscal issue, but that promote economic growth. And third, do this in a fashion that is acceptable to national democracy. Unless you do this, unless you solve this, you don't solve for competitiveness issues, for debt issues, for growth issues, for job issues, and for political issues. This is a really important formulation because you realize very quickly that while the ECB is part of the solution, it is not the complete solution because it cannot deliver these three things. It can align incentives for others to deliver these three things, but it cannot deliver them themselves. It cannot deliver burden sharing among different European countries. It cannot solve the problem of competitiveness, of malfunctioning labor market, of antiquated pension systems. So the ECB is part of the journey. Go back to, to the original, to the, the chart, if you remember, is part of the journey, but it cannot deliver the destination. It needs the help of others to do so. Exactly the same analysis applies to the Fed. So just like the ECB is buying times for the politicians to get their act together, just like the ECB is trying to reassure citizens, don't run away. Don't take your money out of Greek, out of Spanish banks, out of Italian banks. The Fed is also providing time for the system to heal, but it cannot heal it itself. Now, when you think of the Fed, think not only of the fact that on September 13th, we had a central bank that gave us forward guidance all the way to, 
mid-2015. For any monetary economist who was raised on the concept that monetary policy e acts with long and variable lags, the concept that the central bank can commit itself to 2015 implies that it can, it can see to 2017 and 2018. And yet we have a central bank that has committed itself, or at least, as they like to say, it's more than a forecast, but less than a promise, somewhere in between, into 2015. We are gonna have open-ended purchases of securities. And importantly, the Fed has indicated that it will keep its foot on the accelerator well into the recovery. So what's happening is you have the central banks trying to buy time, recognizing, as Chairman Bernanke said, that the benefits come with costs and risks, with collateral damage and unintended consequences. You should have no doubt, no doubt, that the current leaderships of both central banks are committed and will likely do more before they do less. And it's more, and it's more, it's more, it's very likely that they will be pushed to do more. So the rest of us, whether you're a household, a company, an investor, you have to internalize this. And you have to understand and respect that the central banks are all in. But it does not mean, and this is critical, it does not mean you map one to one between the willingness of the Fed to do something and the ECB and the full effectiveness. It is not a one-to-one -one mapping. And the longer the central banks are left carrying the burden, the more likely that the intended benefits will decline and the costs and risks will go up. So what about the second group, the politicians? Without their involvement, without their ability to take difficult decisions, and the first panel spoke to some of these, we will not solve the fundamental problems facing the Western economies. And what are they? Too little economic growth, too high unemployment, particularly among the young and the long-term unemployed, too much debt in the wrong places, too great political polarization, and too much income and wealth inequality. Ironically, I worked on the Latin American debt crisis of the 80s. That was the same list. And we know that that debt crisis led to a lost decade. So for Europe, the elected representative have to consolidate the gains that have been made due to the ECB, have to move forward on the four stools of European unity, and have to sell this to the electorate. In this country, it's about addressing structural headwinds to growth, the functioning of the labor market, the functioning of the credit market, the, the functioning of housing, housing finance, and credit intermediation, where many pipes, especially to the smaller and medium-term enterprises, are still blocked. That is what it takes. And you have to do that in a way that convinces people that you're leading them somewhere that's better than where they are, and that is a problem. Remember the third group. The longer the economic malaise continues, the longer what we call the new normal continues, the more disengagement you get from the street. And in certain cases, as in the case of Greece, it becomes complete rejection. Complete economic, financial, political, and social rejection by the people. The economy implodes, the people lose trust in the financial system, they lose trust in the politician, and social unrest goes up. So all this has to be done while maintaining the interest of the citizens. And we are already seeing people self-insure. When we talk about companies with massive cash on their, on, on their balance sheet when they're earning zero in nominal terms, why is it rational? because they're self-insuring. Now, what does all this mean? For the next 12 months, the US will grow by one and a half to 2% in historical terms, it will look low. Europe will contract by one to one and a half percent. And we believe China soft lands, so it slows, slows to six and a half to 
that is a sluggish global economy that is still too close to stall speed. Fortunately, most companies can deal with this, especially the large multinational. They have the cash. Households are very binary. Those with global skill sets and wealth will do just fine, but too many, too many will suffer greatly under, that, under, under our baseline. And governments will still be saddled with issues of sovereign creditworthiness and recurrent concerns about deficits and debt. This is the baseline, but what's different about today is not just this baseline that's really unusual. It is also that the tails of the distribution are much fatter. Most of us operate in a world with the very normal bell curve, and they really are reassuring. They're very comforting. High probability of a certain outcome, and while there are tails, they're very thin. That is not the world we're looking at in today. The world we're looking at in today, the baseline is much flatter, much flatter. And the two-sided tails are much fatter. So we've already talked about one element of the left tail, which is the US fiscal cliff. That by itself, a 4% of GDP contraction, can throw the US economy into recession. And the minute you throw the US economy into recession, bad things are going to happen around the world. Now, it's not our baseline. It's a risk. We think more likely that there will be some resolution that limits the fiscal contraction about 1% to 1.5%, but it is a serious ri risk. So there's risk. There's two risks coming from Europe over the next few months. The Greek politician and the Troika have to sell to the Greek people the new program. And Spain has to find a way to engage with the ECB while maintaining domestic legitimacy. Then there's China. China is slowing, and we think China soft lands, but we also recognize that China's growth model becomes less potent in a sluggish global economy at a time when China itself is managing the middle income transition. And if you don't care about middle income transitions, you should. Because Michael Spence, the Nobel Prize winner, who's done a lot of work on this, will remind you that only five countries, five countries, have managed the middle in income transition at high growth rates, and none were as complex as China is today. It is understandable that everybody wants to look at the left tails, at the negative things, but let's not forget the positive tails, and John mentioned them today. Technological progress is amazing. Farmers now in developing countries can use climate technology delivered on their phones to time better the applications of fertilizers. They can time better their access to markets. Price discovery has become much easier. 3D technology. Shale gas reducing input prices. There are many technological changes to be excited about. And then there's all the cash on the sideline. If you can engage that cash in productive investment, if you get the Sputnik moment in terms of policy that unleashes the animal spirit, then the right tail becomes really significant. So what we are talking about to use Bernanke's term, is an unusually uncertain baseline. Large tails, asymmetrical, but large tails, and therefore the possibility of multiple equilibria and part dependency. Behavioralists will tell you that when human beings face such an outlook, an uncertain middle and fat tails, two types of behavior tend to dominate. The first type of behavior is paralysis. You simply cannot internalize all this. It's too uncomfortable. It's too unthinkable. Those of you who saw the movie Amadeus will remember the scene in which Mozart, for the first time, plays his composition in front of the emperor, simple man, 
and the emperor is, is trying to understand this composition. And then he's asked, what do you think? And he goes, uh, uh, too many notes. So the first risk is of too many notes. The other risk is much more, is as dangerous. And it's what companies fall into and what governments fall into. It's called active inertia. Don Sull at the London Business School has written a lot about it. You recognize the paradigm change, you recognize things are different, you become active, but you end up doing exactly the same as what you've been doing before. And there are many examples of that. This world requires something else. This world requires a mix of absorption and agility. Agility to respond as you get more information and as the distribution of outcomes becomes clearer. And absorption because there's a high probability that you will make a mistake at some point. Not because you want to make a mistake, but because the world has become so unpredictable. And we only get there if there's a greater sense of collective responsibility among the three different groups that I put up on that cartoon. It is very tempting to turn your back on this because it is a very challenging and uncomfortable place, but we should have no doubt as what that means. If we turn our back on this challenge, then our children's generation will be encumbered with very high debt, very low growth dynamics, high unemployment, pronounced inequality of income and wealth, and dysfunctional, and dysfunctional politics. And if that happens, then for the first time in a very long time in the West, our kids' generation will be worse off than that of their parents. Thank you very much. Just come here and I'll come. Oh, we, no, no, we'll get, we'll get you, get, you get here and I'll, I'll. Thank you very much. That was, that was fascinating. Um, I should say that there are copies of the speech without, without I think, the mention of Mozart, um, which will be available um, later um, upstairs. I was going to push you a bit on a couple of things, um, both of which really to do with your, your drawing, where you had, the, um, you had the, the, the voters and, to some extent, actually companies at the back. You had these people sitting on huge amounts of money. And I wondered what effect you thought the election would have on those people. Do you expect companies, when, once, the, once the American election is out of the way, to start spending money, to start doing things, or do you expect it to have the opposite? So well, I'm that's going to come to Europe as well. I'm going to pick up on something that Maya said. If, if you look at the campaign narrative as an economist, mm. not as a politician, as an economist, it doesn't take you long to realize that neither side can deliver on their promises. Not because they're not willing, but they simply won't be able. Why? Because the system has reduced the degrees of freedom for policy much more than people are willing to acknowledge. So the systems would be operating here, and polarized politics have gotten us operating here. And I think people recognize that, certainly companies recognize that. So the big question becomes, does the election outcome deliver the ability to operate here in the middle? Mm -hmm. And that has to, as Greg Ipp said earlier, it has to do first what happens in Congress. It has to do how quickly can politicians walk back from certain commitments, because that the solution is compromise, it's not the extreme. So I think people are going to wait not just to see the presidential election outcome, but also to see what happens in Congress, and then to see whether, how quickly people walk back in the first 100 days. If there's a perception that we're going towards the middle, and the fiscal cliff is going to be a real test in this during the lame duck session, then I think you start seeing um, people spend cash. No one, no one wants to hold cash mm. at 0% nominal and negative 2, negative 3% real. People understand that financial repression means taking purchasing power away from you, and most people want to protect themselves. But they also know that cash gives you optionality value, and that's why they're holding it. So you could trigger quite a response as long as you get to that, to that middle. What about in Europe? I mean, you, um, you sung a, a song of sort of sunny optimism about Europe. Um, <laughs> but if you look at those voters there, 
to go to the how bad do you think it could get? Do you think there is a danger not just of the euro coming apart, but in effect the whole European Union coming apart? You seem to hint towards that, but I just wanted to push you on that. So I'm glad you say um, I sounded optimistic. <laughs> Most of the time I'm accused of sounding pessimistic. It's British irony, I think. Um, I have to tell my wife. <laughs> um, let me just tell you, we came very close, very, very close at the end of July to an implosion of the eurozone. Mm. Very, very close. Europe with Spanish yields, um, Italian yields at 7% or above, with money flowing out of, of, this, of, of the periphery. Just to give you one number, in July alone, Switzerland got capital inflows equivalent to 20% of its GDP. Mm. Right? Now, multiply that by a large number to include what went into Germany, what went into the US. So had the ECB not acted, they would have, Europe would have lost control of its destiny. Since then, we've gotten to somewhat better place, but it's a very unstable equilibrium. You, but Pimco, you talked about buying Italian and Spanish debt. How, how much have you gone into that in a big way? So we have gone, I, you know, and I've said this to policymakers, you've convinced us on Italian and Spanish bond to go in up to our knee. <laughs> you really need us to go in you know, up here, but up to our knee, because we know that the ECB cannot deliver outcomes. Right? Um, now, the other thing that's, courageous, that's important is that the politicians have agreed on the four stools, fiscal union, monetary union to be accompanied by fiscal union, banking union, and political integration. Now comes the implementation stage. Mm. My own view, and I remember being at this conference two years ago and saying that Greece would most likely default and people thinking that I was crazy, okay? My own view is that Europe needs to make a very critical decision. Either it opts for a smaller, less imperfect union, or it opts for the East Germany, West Germany model, which you do something that makes no economic sense, but makes political sense, but you're willing to pay, you're willing to write checks for a very large number of years, as West Germany is still doing today for East Germany de facto. Right? As long as Europe doesn't make that decision, and this is a purely political decision, there will be a repeat of instability in the period ahead because the ECB can hold things together for a while, but if politicians don't step up to the plate, as they'd say here, then the ECB will find it very difficult to do so. We should come to questions from the audience and, and please put your hands up. I'm going to ask one quick thing on that. Which out of those two alt alternatives, the smaller Europe or the bigger, more federal version, do you think is more likely? Um, if you ask me what should happen, yeah. I would tell you smaller less imperfect, and that is also in the interest of countries like Greece, because Greece will find it very difficult to grow within the Eurozone. So if people were to step back and try and, and, and be rational and recognize that whatever route is taken is gonna be bumpy, this one promises a better long-term for the Eurozone and for a country like Greece. That's what should happen. What's likely to happen is that the politicians will pursue this one, but will not be willing to pay for it properly. And then it will shift this way, not because the politicians change their mind, because the people will end up doing what they did in Argentina in December 2001 and saying, I don't see light at the end of the tunnel. I don't want to follow this prescription. More optimism. Um, there, was a, there, was a, there was a hand up somewhere. I saw somebody in the back. Thank you. You know, as your cover depicted, we're in uncharted waters with the central bankers, you know, of the majority of global GDP leading. Is it hubris or hope? Is it hubris that their models will work or uh, hope that, um, you know, that there's nothing else to do because there's no evidence of democracies taking things away from their citizenry? Um, first, I don't think it's hubris because Ben Bernanke, as far back as August 2010 at Jackson Hall, acknowledged that the minute you go unconventional, you have to worry about the balance of, quote, benefits, costs, and risks. And he said, over time, the costs and risks go up and expected benefits come down. So I don't think there's hubris on the side of um, the central banks. I think there's a, two other things. One you mentioned, one you didn't. The one you mentioned is this notion that central banks can build bridges. And you build a bridge in the hope that the governments and our elected officials will respond and will start making difficult decisions. In the US, I agree completely with Maya, it's a political issue, not an engineering problem. It's a political problem. 
in Europe, it's a political problem and it's a bit tough on the engineering side. There's also a third issue, which is what, what central bankers, I suspect, will tell you a small responsibility. Yes, you don't have the best tools. Yes, you live in a, in a third best, fourth best world. But there's a sense of moral obligation that you need to do something if others aren't. Because if you don't, then you give up the option of buying time against delivering really bad outcomes. The one thing that they, I think, know and we should realize is that you can't play this as a repeated game, as game theorists will tell you. Right? You can't force a cooperative game on uncooperative people. Right? So it only works for a while, but I think that central banks feel that, that they have a moral obligation because they are subject to, many f to fewer constraints than other government entities. Okay, go to another question. I was going to ask one very quick follow-up is that if you take that, you've talked about the risks of central bankers acting aggressively. Well, one risk in some ways is that they lose their jobs. You've already got Mitt Romney saying he wants to get rid of Bernanke. You've got other people queuing up to begin to attack Draghi. Is that, is that part of what you see coming ahead? Part of it is that. Part of it is they lose their independence. The political system says, wait a minute, so you are a quasi-fiscal. And, and what are the checks and balances on you? Right? And next thing you know, we reverse what has been a very important step forward in terms of central bank autonomy. And part of it, and, and, and I did this in a paper that I presented to St. Louis Fed, is just the amount of collateral damage. Mm. There are whole segments of the marketplace that are no longer operating because you cannot operate at artificially low interest rates. The system is not built to operate at artificially low interest rates. So you get all sorts of distortions coming up. We almost got to finish. I have one quick question. There's one here. Yes, uh, last week's uh, IMF financial stability report uh, devoted an enormous amount of time uh, to the risk of a large correction in the U.S. Treasury market or the Japanese government bond market. What would be your probability assessment for such an event uh, as early as next year? So you get a large correction for one of two reasons. Either the economy picks up and the Fed feels that it no longer needs to use its printing press to buy securities. And if you're a bond purchaser or seller, you gotta respect that someone with a printing press is buying securities in an open-ended fashion, right? So if the reason why the Fed is doing QE disappears because the economy picks up, then you will get a significant correction in the bond market. The second way you get a significant correction in the bond market which is less likely, and I'll explain why, is that credit risk is priced properly. And if credit risk is priced properly, then the credit premium wouldn't be negative as it is today in the US. That is less likely because remember, you cannot replace something with nothing. And as long as Europe is under bigger problem, has bigger problems than the US, the US will benefit from this flight to quality. So the correction you get is either because the economy picks up or because um, the credit risk, we think neither is likely. It's possible, but neither is likely. And we're likely to see range-bound interest rates at artificially low level for a while still. Very quickly, Japan, and then we should stop. So Japan is everybody's puzzle, right? And, and Japan is an economy that has benefits that we should never forget a net creditor, still surplus, but declining, and huge home bias. The problem with Japan is gonna come elsewhere is that their model was... May I have your attention, please? <laughs> correct, We're power. <laughs> we have power over so many things as well. That's a reaction to Japan. Go on. So, so, <laughs> so, so I suspect that f at least for the next 12 months, Japan is going to continue to surprise how can a country with such high debt to GDP sustain such low interest rates? And it's because it's got the home bias very strong in Japan. The problem with Japan is it has, is pursuing a model where it exports its production and then imports the value added from this production. And as we noticed with China, that can be subject to all sorts of shocks. 
I'm going to thank Mohammed very much. As, you, as I noted at the beginning, one of his annoying habits is that he writes quite well, but now I notice that he's entered the field of also designing covers, which <laughs> <laughs> my job is getting worse. Thank you.